<laughs> Good evening. My name is Trevor Lewis. I'm a freshman here at Stanford, and I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speaker and kick off tonight's discussion. The Stanford College Republicans is proud to partner with Young America's Foundation to bring conservative ideas to Stanford's <laughs> campus. It is thanks to YAP that we are lucky enough to host tonight's speaker. This evening's speaker made his name as an accomplished novelist and screenwriter. He is the author of multiple internationally best-selling crime novels, including True Crime, which is later adapted to film by Clint Eastwood, and Don't Say a Word, which became a movie starring Michael Douglas. He is the winner of numerous awards, including the Mystery Writers of America's Edgar Award, which he won twice, and the Thumping Good Read Award from W.H. Smith. Stephen King called him the most original novelist of crime and suspense since Cornell Woolwich. As a screenwriter, tonight's speaker wrote the screenplays to A Shock to the System, which starred Michael Caine, One Missed Call, which starred Edward Burns, and Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer, starring Dean Cain. His most recent work of fiction is the serial fantasy thriller podcast, Another Kingdom, which was on iTunes' list of the top 100 podcasts and is now being published as a novel trilogy. This evening's speaker has also produced many works of nonfiction and political commentary. He is a contributing editor to City Journal and has written numerous articles for them, including a report from his experience embedded with American troops in Afghanistan. His essays and op-eds on politics, religion, movies, and literature have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and elsewhere. He currently does a Monday through Thursday podcast, The Andrew Clavin Show, for The Daily Wire. Fitting for tonight's event, this evening's speaker has also written a memoir entitled The Great Good Thing, a secular Jew comes to faith in Christ. Just to let everyone know, this event is being filmed, um, and also the uh, Q&A afterwards will be. And if anyone needs to leave at any time, please exit out of that door. The College Republicans would like to thank our speaker for taking the time to come and thank Young America's Foundation, which has been our greatest partner on Stanford's campus. With that, I am honored and excited to welcome Mr. Andrew Clayton. Mic, yeah, is the, is the mic working? Yeah. Okay, because this is all the voice I got, so uh, can you hear me? Um, so here's something kind of ironic. If by ironic uh, you mean absurd, uh, I was actually going to begin uh, this speech uh, by talking about uh, a little bit about my discomfort about the fact uh, that the left and the right tend to troll each other and make each other crazy, and I'm giving this speech today about the, um, the Judeo-Christian foundations of Western civilization. And, and I was uncomfortable about the idea that some people might take that to mean uh, that I didn't like gay people or I didn't like Muslim people. And I was going to talk about my discomfort about that, and the fact that that's not where I'm coming from at all. But then, <laughs> uh, two members of the administration sent out a newsletter, uh, Susie Brubaker Cole, the Vice Provost of Student Affairs, and Tiffany Steinman, the Dean uh, for Religious Life, sent out a, a newsletter I got it. Sent out a newsletter. How's that? All right. There we go. Um, essentially accusing me of uh, being a, a, an anti-Islamic bigot um, and saying they were they were deeply disturbed uh, by the fact that I was going to speak and they found it unacceptable uh, that this should be advertised on campus. And I, you know, normally people call me names all the time. Obviously, but. Uh, Normally I don't respond because they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know who I am. They've never heard anything I do. But, but um, when somebody when somebody in the administration of a college calls you a bigot, um, I think that deserves a response. And my response is basically, screw you. <laughs> I don't know why anybody in this room or on this campus could give one hair on a rat's ass what these two people think is truly disturbing, okay? You are all free, strong, healthy American men and women. You are perfectly capable of sitting and listening to me talk without exploding, without dying, without losing your minds. 
and waiting until I'm finished, and then, as I hope you will, staying and presenting your objections or your disagreements to me and allowing me to respond. That is how civilized people behave. There's nothing unacceptable uh, or hateful about what I have to say. I have criticized and made fun of Islam, Catholicism, Buddhism, Judaism, and my own religion, most, probably most of all, Episcopalianism. Because religions are systems of ideas. That's what they are. They're not a race. They're not something you're necessarily born with. They're systems of ideas that you believe in and preach and promulgate, okay? If you can't debate and mock and criticize and talk about ideas, why do you need a university in the first place? I mean, what's the point of what you're doing here, okay? Here's the thing I want to say about this, and then I'll stop and I'll get into my speech, but this is probably more important. There's only two systems of speech, okay? There's free speech, and there's speech that's controlled by brute force, by power. Those are the only two kinds. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. When you start saying somebody is hateful because you disagree with them, or somebody is unacceptable, the question is, who makes that decision? Who makes that call? It's always people with power. It's always the person with power who makes the call that something's unacceptable or hateful. It may be the power of a mob who shouts you down. It may be the power of the government. It may be the power of these two people who obviously have influence and authority in this school, right? That means that you're going to be hearing only what the powerful people want you to hear. Now, powerful people are always telling you, whether it's Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi, doesn't matter, left or right, Trump or Obama, they're always telling you that they're speaking up for the little guy. But if you listen carefully, powerful people are always speaking up for their own power, almost always, okay? Whatever they say, it ain't gonna cost them their power, very rarely, so, so when you let people dictate to you what's hateful, what's unacceptable, what can't be listened to, what can't be said, you are listening to powerful people protect your own, their own power, and you're becoming pawns of those powerful people. And that's why I say that this, for, for people who are in power and in the university where you should be talking about all ideas all the time, this is truly despicable. It is truly wrong and truly despicable. That was my response to that. So let's talk about the, the Christian, Judeo-Christian foundations of Western civilization. It doesn't mean what anybody thinks it means, okay? It really doesn't. One of the things when people talk about this, they, they start to ask kind of stupid questions, uh, or simple questions, like, were the founding fathers Christians? Okay, now we know, like, for instance, that Thomas Jefferson believed that Jesus was the greatest ethical teacher of all time, but he didn't believe in the miracles. And he famously is said to have gone through his Bible and cut out all the miraculous sections with a razor, with a knife, and then put together his own Bible uh, that just had the ethical teaching in it. John Adams seems to have gone to church. It's a little hard to know what he thought. And uh, Ben Franklin is, for me, one of the most interesting people because he was a guy who was kind of a very, very practical guy, and he felt religion was a practical thing that you ought to have. And then slowly, over time, he began to feel that, no, actually, that was proof of God's existence. And by the time he died, and it, because he was very old by the time the revolution came around, he was actually a believer, and he was the one who suggested that the Constitutional Congress start with a prayer, and was shocked when nobody else thought of it like that. But it doesn't matter. That's not what the foundation of a society is. The foundation of the society is pretty much the same as the foundation of a person. It's where you come from, and what is woven into your personality such that you cannot get away from it, even if you don't agree with it. Even if you don't agree with it, it's still part of you, okay? I'm a dad, I have a grown son and daughter, and I know that there's a big difference, especially when they were young, between the way they responded to criticism from a pal and the way they resp responded to criticism from a parent, right? I think we all know this. If your buddy says to you, dude, you're hammering the beer a little bit too much, maybe you ought to dial it back, you know, what, what's your response? It's like, yeah, you know, I have been stressed and maybe I should stop a little bit. If your dad says to you, son, I think you may have a drinking problem, it's like, stay out of my life, why are you bothering me? You know, what's wrong? If you're going out uh, uh, to a party and your roommate says to you, uh, you know, the way you're dressed is a little suggestive, maybe you're sending the wrong message, maybe you think about it, maybe you think your roommate's a prude, whatever. But if your mother says to you, are you going out in that, right? You, you go nuts. Why? Because your parents are who you are. 
Your parents have set the standards by which you live, even if you reject those standards. They are woven into your personality forever. You will never, ever get away from the people who raised you and the things that they put inside you. Christianity is like that to this society. It is woven into it. If you don't believe me, then ask yourself this. I mean, in, in Iran, since the Islamist revolution in Iran, something like between five and 6,000 gay people have been hanged for being gay. In Brunei, they recently, recently passed laws, just, you know, just the other day passed laws saying that homosexuals could be stoned. They put off enforcing these laws because of pressure from outside, but basically if you're gay, they can bury you up to your head and throw rocks at you until you're dead, okay? And yet, no American gay activist has walked into a Muslim bakery and said, bake a cake for my gay wedding. My friend, the comedian Steven Crowder, has done it because he's out of his mind and he's trying to make fun of people. But no gay activist has done it. Why not? Why not? Because the Christian guy who's sitting in the middle of nowhere thinking, you know, hey, I don't care if you're gay, but I don't, I, I don't want to be part of your religious ceremony because it's against my religion. He's the guy they target. Why? Because that Christian, because they're talking to themselves. They're talking to themselves in the same way if you're arguing with your father in your mind, you're really arguing with yourself. They are talking to themselves. And that is the way in which Christianity, we call it Judeo Christianity because we like Jews and we want to be nice to the Jews. It's really Christianity. It comes down to us almost directly. <laughs> I mean, let's have some missed words, you know. Uh, that's the way Christianity is woven into our society. I mean, the people who formed our society, the ideas that formed our society come from a place that used to be called Christendom, right? Europe used to be called Christendom because it was the place where the Christians were and you could tell it was the place where the Christians were because if you disagreed with them, they set you on fire. <laughs> that's, how you, that's how you knew you were in Christendom because you said, I don't agree with you. They put wood under you and lit it and you were gone, right? So what does it mean? What does it really mean? I mean, for one thing, when you look at ideas, if you study the philosophy of the West, and this doesn't whether it's Nietzsche, who was completely God was dead, or whether it's Immanuel Kant, who worked very hard to restore uh, the basis of Christianity in a sort of unknown realm. No matter who you're talking to, all these ideas come from, all of Western ideas can be traced back in a, in a way to two people. I call them the, the telemons of, of Western civilization because I'm the only person in America who knows what the word telemon means. <laughs> And it makes me feel special, but a telemon, you know, I don't know if you ever see a, a column that looks like a woman, it's called a karyatid, a column that looks like a man, it's called a telemon. And there's two telemons who hold up Western civilization by their ideas, they're Socrates and Jesus, a gay guy and a Jew, okay? <laughs> Which is, by the way, one of the reasons I agree with the left that nobody should ever be excluded, because you never know who's going to get the good idea, could be the gay guy, could be the Jew, you know, so you let everybody talk. <laughs> and Socrates and Jesus, there's some very important uh, similarities between these two guys who stand at the center and at the base of Western civilization. Both of them lived, like you, at a time when intellectuals thought that there was no such thing as truth, that truth was relative, that it didn't matter, uh, that it was different in different places, there was different morality, there was no one morality. Socrates who came about 300 years before Jesus, he, he had the sophists and the philosophers who basically thought, you know, uh, any argument that you could make was a good argument, it didn't matter whether it was true or not. And Jesus, of course, you remember, faced Pontius Pilate, and Jesus said, I speak the truth, and Pilate said, what is truth? What is truth? Because he was the sophisticated Roman guy, and that's what they thought. Both Socrates and Jesus disagreed. Both believed that there was such a thing as objective, moral truth. But both of them thought it was very, very difficult to talk about. It was not something you could just say, this is what it is. The objective moral truth is A, B, C, and D. They both got to it through uh, roundabout means. Socrates would ask people questions. It would drive them nuts, right? You, you thought you knew exactly what you believed. He would ask you questions until you just could not support your point of view anymore. And then he would suggest that there might be another way for you to go. Jesus, of course, spoke in parables stories that had to be interpreted and could be interpreted in different ways. But more importantly, he was a parable. He said, I am the truth. So his life, his actions, the things that happened to him were the truth. Very complicated. Every time, I mean, people write to me often, Christians get angry at me too, by the way, and they, they write to me often and say, well, Jesus said this, and this is the truth, and Christians know this. It's not that easy. It's, it's much more complicated than that. 
Another similarity is both these men were murdered by the state. They were murdered by the state, both of them for blasphemy, essentially for hate speech, okay? One of the reasons why I feel you should never censor anybody. Could be Socrates, could be Jesus, okay? Remember, when they killed them, they thought that they were the good people doing the good thing for a good reason. Both of them were murdered for what they said, okay? And the third thing, and maybe the most important thing, is both of them, after they were dead, took over Western civilization. Socrates did it because he had a student named Plato, right, who wrote about him. Plato had a student named Aristotle, and Aristotle had a student named Alexander the Great. I think that was, I guess it was Mr. and Mrs. Great were his parents, right? <laughs> Alexander the Great, who conquered what would become the West. He conquered Western civilization and turned it into the Hellenic world, the Greek-like world, the world that was like the values that he had learned from Aristotle, who had learned them from Plato, who had learned them from Socrates. Obviously, I'm making this very simplistic, but it's still kind of fair. Okay. Finally, of course, Rome conquered what Alexander had conquered, and that became the basis of Western civilization. And after that, Jesus, in the person of Christianity, conquered Rome. Everything that happened after that comes from those two ideas coming together, the ideas of Socrates and the ideas of Jesus. They came together most impressively in the work of Thomas Aquinas, the uh, 13th century philosopher, Christian philosopher. But that was basically what shaped the ideas that people had, what shaped everything that people thought and the way they looked at the world, okay? And every Everything that came out of that, that was like the stuff that your mother and father or whoever raised you taught you. That was the stuff that made the beginning, that made everything at the beginning. All right? Now, in order to understand the effect of the ideas of Jesus and Socrates, or as they sometimes call it, Athens and Jerusalem, uh, or as we sometimes call it, Christianity, because Christianity and Aristotle became so interwoven, there's absolutely no way to separate them at this point. One of the things you have to understand is that ideas work themselves out over time, over a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to understand the ramifications of an idea, okay? I sometimes hear people say, well, Thomas Jefferson, how could he be for freedom? He owns slaves, okay? That's like saying, Isaac Newton, he's supposed to be such a great scientist, why didn't he invent the electric light bulb, right? Isaac Newton had everything he needed to make a light bulb. It, all the principles were the same, all the material was there. There's no reason Isaac Newton couldn't make a light bulb. No reason it should take 300 years from Isaac Newton discovering there was such a thing as science to somebody invented the light bulb. Ideas work their way out over time. And so it's not the ideas at any given moment. This is the kind of, what I think is a stupid argument that we often get into, where people say, well, you say Christianity believes this, but here somebody did that. Ideas work themselves out over time. So let me just talk about some of the ideas that work themselves out from Christianity. Some of the important ideas, ramifications, that work themselves out over time as the West progressed. One really important idea was the idea that you are an individual with a conscience. I hear people say, I heard Bill Maher say this once, that morality, you know, it's just common sense. It's just common sense. Well, if it's common sense, a lot of people didn't think of this. And, you know, the, the individual is an invention of the West. The individual is something the West discovered that the individual had a conscience. If you live in a country where I was joking before that Christians used to burn you, right, if, they, if you disagree, there are still countries where if you disagree with your, their religion, they kill you or they hound you or they chase you out. Those are countries that don't understand the idea of the individual with an individual conscience. But the problem that Christians had is that their God was a person, okay? Their God was a person. God started out with Moses saying to Moses, I am this burning bush that you see, this eternal uh, growth and destruction that you see in the universe has a personality, I am. And of course, Jesus embodied that personality. And God, if God is a person and man is made in God's image, then people are also people. You know, the people are individuals. The other thing that came from that is that people, that there was such a thing as natural law and that you could deduce from the way people were what they were supposed to be like. If you knew something about God and you knew something about people, you could tell what they were supposed to be like. And one of the things they were supposed to be like was they were supposed to be free. Why did they think people were supposed to be free? They had to. They had to because they believed in an all-good God 
and yet they could see that people did evil things. They could see that strong people dominated the weak, hurt the weak, right? So how could they explain that? How could they explain that God, a good God, an all good God, allowed evil people to triumph in this life as they do, as they often do? Well, it turned out they thought, well, God must want us to be free. He must want us to be able to make a choice. He must want us to have free will. Almost all the arguments that go on today about brain science and doesn't mean we have no free will were going on in the 12th century. They were going on immediately as soon as Christianity started to think about itself. This idea of freedom and the individual conscience started to work itself out. These things are not obvious, right? These things have to be worked out over time. Not everybody thought of them. The West did. Okay. The idea that you could tell what people, what natural law was by studying people and by studying God created the idea that there were certain things about us that were naturally right, that we naturally owned, that were ours. And every, every civilization, every idea has uh, basic ideas that can't be proved, but prove everything else. In math, they call these axioms. You can't prove that A plus B equals B plus A, but you just know that to be true. It's self-evident, okay? We have self-evident ideas that come from our idea of a free individual human being with rights, with the, the need to be free. And we all know what those are. We know that among those rights, right, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, okay? Now think about this for a minute. Okay. The, the, our declaration, our founding document says you were created, your creator endowed you with life, liberty, and those pursuit of happiness, and this is self-evident. It's self-evident, okay? You don't have to prove it. We just know it to be so. Now self-evident doesn't mean obvious, because if it were obvious, somebody would have thought of it before. But the funny thing about the declaration is it goes on to say that governments are formed to protect these rights. The reason you have a government is to protect these rights. Name another government for that that had been formed to protect those rights. Zero, zip, none. It had never happened before. I mean, think of them. Think of like Pharaoh burying his servants with him when he died. You think he was trying to protect their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It just didn't occur to them until they had 1,700 years to think about what it meant that Jesus Christ was Lord. Okay? That is what... That is how they got to that point, that it was self-evident. It doesn't mean obvious. It just means it doesn't have to be proved. Anyone can see it. And by the way, the whole idea that a government is your servant works for you also from the Gospels, also from Jesus saying, Jesus says, the Goyim, the Gentiles, they have rulers who rule over them. But among you, your rulers will be your slaves. Your rulers will be your servants. Now, this idea of a pursuit of happiness is another one of these ideas we've totally forgotten what it means. You know, this is one of the key ideas of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, is what is, one of the things they ask themselves, they ask themselves this really interesting question. What is the best thing? What is the best thing? Remember in, uh, is it Conan the Barbarian, where they say, what is the best thing? And he says, to triumph over to your enemies and hear the wailing of their women or something like that. Aristotle asked himself, what is the best thing? And he said, well, the best thing has to be the thing that you want in and of itself. You don't want it for something else. So money can't be the best thing because you get money to get stuff. So the stuff is better than the money, right? You don't care about the money. You care about the stuff. But the one thing that you get for itself is happiness, or what in the Greek is eudaimonia, good spirits. It doesn't really mean happiness, like, oh, I'm so happy. It means uh, what Jesus called life in abundance. It means that you love life even when it's hard. That life is like a movie. Even when you're crying, you enjoy the movie. Even in grief, you are alive and you're vital. That is what it means. It means this kind of joy of life. How did you find it? Well, Aristotle you know, said that you found it through virtue. That you found that the, the human mind could reason its way to virtue. And when you acted in accordance with reason, you would be happy. Now, Thomas Jefferson said he wasn't, it was a... Uh, he was not a, um, an Aristotelian, but he was one of the, an Epicurean, I think he said. Yeah, he was an Epicurean. An Epicurean, Epicurus was a dis disciple, or a descendant of Aristotle. But still, these guys weren't talking about getting rich. They weren't talking about having property. They weren't talking about all the things that we talk about today. You know, the right 
talks about having happiness. They say, oh, you have the right to pursue happiness, you can start your own business. And the left talks about, you know, pursuing happiness, oh, you have a right to screw an ostrich and call yourself a bird, you know. <laughs> I, think I've, I think I've got that right. I think that's a fair representation. But no, it, the happiness is a very specific thing. It is the idea of pursuing virtue, pursuing reason. And these are the things that, you know, that, they, that the founders were thinking about when they wrote this document. One other thing, by the way, I should say, is they were also thinking about the fact that people suck. If you ever read the, um, the Federalist Papers, if you've never read them, you really should. Every page is just about one subject, people suck. They knew this because of the idea of original sin. The idea of original sin, translated into English, is people suck, okay? And all they do for hundreds of pages in the, in the Federalist Papers is talk about the fact that people suck, so don't give them any power. How will we stop them from having power? Well, we'll put some power here, and we'll put some power there, and then they'll have to fight over the power, right? And that's why, you know, people like me get so upset with the left when they say, oh, the government should do it. Let the government do it. Let the government, because we know that when power is concentrated, people abuse power. Why? Because people suck, all right? Now, there's another idea that comes out of this. Some of the stuff that's funny about this is all the people who hate Christianity and Western civilization most believe in some of this stuff so passionately. Like, I love it when people talk about multiculturalism, right? Now, multiculturalism, if it means equally good, is a nonsense. That's a nonsense. Okay? Nobody, nobody believes that. Nobody believes that, okay? Thinks that the culture of the South, where they held black people slaves, should have remained in place, and it's just as good as a place where they didn't hold black people slaves. Nobody thinks that. It's a zero percent of people think that's true, okay? So when people say, well, all, you know, there's, there's a sign in LA, it's a jeans commercial or something, it says, respect all cultures. And I think, you know, kiss my ass, respect all cultures. I don't respect a culture where they uh, hold black people slaves. I don't respect a culture where women have no rights. I don't respect it. It's not as good as a culture where women do have rights. It's not as good as a culture where there are no slaves, okay? So, but multiculturalism is a Western idea. It has a lot of uh, history in Rome, where if you study the history of Rome and why the Republic fell, it was because more and more people were demanding that they had Roman rights, even though they weren't Romans. They said, we are part of this country, too, okay? St. Paul says, I'm a Roman, right? He's a Jew, but he says, I'm, I'm a Roman. I have Roman rights of Roman citizenship. And of course, the disciples of Jesus said, in Christ there is no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female, we are all just part of the body of Christ, okay? Those ideas don't come anywhere else. I mean, take a look, go on. If you, if... I've lived all over the place. This is the least racist society on earth. The least, America, least racist country on earth, least. Nobody comes close to second, okay? Look at the city, look at the pictures of cities in America, and look at the pictures of city in Chi cities in China. And look at the difference, okay? Look at the difference of the, you know, what the left calls diversity, what I call different colored people that we have here. All of that comes from our Christian roots, our Christian roots, and our, and our classical roots. And so when I hear the left say, you know, you're, you're a Western uh, chauvinist, you don't believe in multiculturalism. I say, no, I believe in multiculturalism because I'm a Western so chauvinist. You are putting forward, when you put forward the idea that all cultures should be included, you are putting forward a Western idea that's exclusive to the West. It's exclusive to the West. So the people who say the West stinks because we don't include people, we're the only people who, who philosophically include people. Now I want to talk about something really important, and then I, I, want to, I want to stop this quick, oh gee, I do want to stop so I can talk to you, but, but here's a, an important mystery that you will notice if you ever study the Bible, okay? <coughs> These are a few mysterious facts, all right? Nowhere in the Bible is slavery condemned. In fact, there are places in the Bible where they say, you know, if you're a slave, you should obey your master. There's one scene in the Bible where a slave is returned to his master by Paul, I think, or Peter, I can't remember. Um, and yet, and yet, Every single abolitionist who got rid of slavery is not only a Christian, but did it for Christian reasons. Got rid of slavery because of his Christianity, okay? Homosexuality, 
Many Christians still believe it is a sin per se. That is, be a, a, a homosexual is a sin per se. And yet, if you made a map of the places where homosexuals are included and can have equal rights, and then you made a map of Christendom, it would be virtually the same map, okay? Very mysterious, all right? The belief that Christianity is true and other religions are false is, of course, part of every religion, that every religion believes it is true and other religions are false. I'm a Christian. I believe Christianity is true. And, you know, if I'm going to get Ben Shapiro into heaven, I'm going to have to bring him in on the lease. I'm going to have to smuggle that now. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we are this multicultural place that believes that there should not be theocracy, right? That, there sh that our governments should not be run by religious people and there shouldn't be any religious test that's in the Constitution. There shouldn't be any religious testimony. How does this happen? How does it happen that stuff that seems either against Christian tradition or actually against words that are in the book that could be read a certain way. A lot of slaveholders use the Bible to defend their holding slaves, right? A lot of slaveholders use the Bible. How does it happen that a, an essentially Christian culture keeps getting rid of things that don't fit, that gets rid of things on Christian grounds that aren't in the Bible, that aren't commanded in the Bible? I would like to suggest and I've studied this a lot and thought about this a lot because two things I read and talk about every day are the Gospels and the news, right? So I think about a lot how they affect each other. If you watch the way Jesus deals with issues of the day, you will see the way Western culture works, okay? I'll give you my favorite example. It's an example so shocking that many conservatives, even today, want it edited out of the Bible. So help me, there was a movement by conservatives to have this chapter edited out of the Bible because it, some of the earliest copies of the Gospels don't have it in it, don't have the story in there, so they think it was added late. I think it was kept out because it's so obviously Jesus talking and it's so problematical for both sides. And it's, of course, the story of the woman who was taken in adultery and brought to Jesus to be stoned. Now, the idea that a woman who has committed adultery should be stoned is barbaric. At no point in human history can a god of love have thought that that was a good idea. Okay. However that gets into the Bible, however it gets into any book, the idea that a woman who commits adultery should be hit with rocks until she's dead was never an idea commensurate with the god of love. Okay. So you would think that Jesus would say, that's barbaric. Get rid he's God, right? He's the son of God. He, why doesn't he just say, that's a barbaric law. Get rid of that law. That's horrible. Which is kind of what the left would suggest. What the right would say, and I know because I hang out with a lot of them, what they would say is, well, you know, if you stop stoning women who commit adultery, everybody's going to commit adultery. <laughs> it's true, right? So Jesus doesn't say either of those things. He says, yeah, go ahead and stone her, but let him who is without sin throw the first stone. Which is like, you know, I, I don't even want to say what people said when he said that. <laughs> because obviously it leaves, it leaves the law in place and makes it impossible to carry out. There's another comment about slaves and masters in the Bible. It says, God will judge you according to the good you do, whether you are a slave or a master, and he will show no favoritism. Once you know that, slavery gets very, very hard to contain. Almost everywhere that Jesus confronts the law that he thinks should be changed, he infuses it with humanity and love and transforms it without ever getting rid of it. And if you watch the way Western culture evolves, it does that even when we don't want it to. Even when we, left and right, are screaming in each other's faces, frequently, Western culture will transform itself according to Christian principles even as we don't pay any attention. And I will give you an example, and then I'll stop and I'll take your questions. Think about the debate we've had over gay people, okay? Now, I'm, I'm a, a stone conservative, but I have been in favor of gay rights since I was a kid, okay? I'm an artist. I've lived my life in the arts. If I weren't, didn't like gay people, I wouldn't know anybody. I mean, half the people I know are gay. I mean, you can't make a living if you don't like gay people. 
So I've been in favor of this. To me, it was like nothing. It was like being left-handed. I just never cared, okay? But I watched the debate unfold, right and left. And I would hear the left screaming and yelling, as they so often do. So often the left seems to be saying they want to change the power balance, but they really just want to turn the power balance around. They don't want to, they don't want to take the restrictions off gay people. They want gay people to be able to put some restrictions on Christian people who don't want to participate in their lives, you know? Which is just as wrong as far as I'm concerned. Freedom is freedom for everybody, whether you like them or not. But, but a lot of people on the right were saying things about gay people that I thought were untenable. They were saying, oh, you know, it's sick, it's disgusting, they should be, it should be illegal. I was alive when being gay was illegal. You know, I was alive when being gay was illegal. You could, a cop could walk into a gay bar, wait till somebody made a pass on them and arrest them. That, I don't think anybody wants that to come back. So just take a notice of this, take notice of this. Nobody wants that world to come back. And people on the right who 10 years ago, within living memory, were saying horrible things about gay people, now they won't let you say horrible things about gay people. Somebody just, some conservative, a friend of mine, just said something really unfortunate on Twitter. She was fired from every right-wing venue she worked in, okay? She shouldn't have said it, she was wrong to say it, she was fired from every right-wing venue. In other words, even as we're screaming at each other, most, both sides wrong, both sides kind of in the wrong, are because in our hearts, because we're formed by the Christian ethos, because Christianity is our mother and father, because it's in there even when we disagree with it, the society transforms itself along Christian lines. We become better, we become more inclusive, we become more loving, even as we fought each other over the terms in, in the form in which that should take place. Which brings me back to where I started, with screw you ladies. Okay. <laughs> it brings me back to the idea that there is nothing we can't talk about. There is nothing that we should not debate. There is nothing you guys, especially in college, should not be sitting up till four in the morning arguing about. There is no idea too hateful to express, no idea too woke to be, that it should be ridiculed out of, uh, out of society. Talk about it all. Because if you do it under these conditions, if you do it with love, if you do it with Christian love, there's no problem we cannot transform because we're a Judeo-Christian society. Thank you very much, and I'd love to hear all question. We're going to be lining up right here. Now, uh, a couple points per question is, first of all, if you're on this side of the room, we want you to go up and around so we're not talking in front of anybody. And make sure your questions are questions and not just statements. Try to keep it short so as many people as possible can uh, provide a question and try to give good questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering, uh, how do you define uh, Christianity in particular? Do you consider the Eastern Orthodox Church to be part of Christianity? And if so, why doesn't Russia have the same uh, freedom uh, that the United States has? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, some of the uh, some of the greatest Christian work was done by Russian novelists. I mean, yeah. I don't think I would be a Christian today if I hadn't read Crime and Punishment when I was mm -hmm. 19 years old. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the um, that there is in Russia, and I'm not a Russian expert, but I have read a lot of their literature, and it seems to me there is in Russia a strain of uh, Eastern non-individualism that, that keeps them from understanding the idea of individual freedom. It just, it's, it's really painful because communism destroyed the country. It just destroyed the country. And yet when it was over, if you've ever had, there's a wonderful book, and I think it's called something like Secondhand Lives or something like this, just interviews of people after the fall of communism, and they miss it. They say, yes, it made us miserable, it destroyed our country, but we kind of miss it because it gave our lives meaning. And I think that there is something about the idea that meaning in life has to come from everybody around you instead of just yourself and those people close to you. I think that is is in conflict with some of the better ideas of Christianity. That's that basically what I think. But it's a very complicated question, and I don't want to give a simplistic answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wrote my question. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a very similar question. Um, 
you lay out the like plus acceptance you sort of lay out the like and so that's the reason why we have our human rights. Um, do you think the same thing is possible in the Islamic world? Um, if so, why not? You know, I, I really do. Question. But the question, yeah, the, qu the question, the question was, do I think the same advance of human rights is possible in the Islamic world? And and it, the reasons I do are, in some ways, kind of antithetical to every, everything the left believes, and, and make, makes leftists upset when I say it. But I think these ideas are true. I think the ideas of the West are true, and I think if they're true, they're in the human heart. And every religion, look, I don't agree with any religion except my own. Right? That's what a religion is, right? But I do believe that re religions can be rewritten by the human heart, and I think that that's why I'm not a fundamentalist. That's not why I'm not a, a literalist in any way. You know, the religions, the human heart is is in conversation with religion, and so I think these ideas are true. People are individuals. They do have natural rights. They do deserve to be free. Freedom of speech is the only way forward. And so, if an idea is true, I think any human heart can learn it. And I see no reason why the Islamic a world should not be reformed, as in fact the Christian world needed to be reformed. You know, um, one of the reasons we stopped having theocratic government is because the bloodshed that took place because of theocratic government uh, was not in keeping with Christian principles. So we have to wait and see whether Islamic people will feel that the violence that now infects a lot of the Islamic world is that in keeping with Islamic principles, or is it a cancer that needs to be expelled? I mean, that's going to be the question, and I don't know the you know what will happen. Um, so I was wondering, in a, in a secular culture that's affecting like public schools and universities, uh, what steps could we take to uh, make sure we keep that uh, Christian values, uh, you know, to uh, you know, uh, to reignite the Christian values yeah. in the public? Uh, I think I think it's really important. I think we have been the victim. I wrote an article about this for City Journal recently called uh, "Can We Believe?" I think we have been the victim of a 500-year uh, propaganda campaign. Uh, I call it the Enlightenment narrative. The narrative is the church oppressed us, the Enlightenment came, now we're free of religion, and the less religion we have, the more free we'll, we will become. I think that's untrue. I think it was untrue at the time, but I think it made more sense at the time when we thought that the kind of science of Newton would reveal a clockwork universe. That clockwork universe hasn't come about. So what we have to do is we have to argue our faith with actual integrity. It has to be responsive to science. We can't just say, oh, you know, like, Science may say this, but the Bible says that. We have to be responsive to science. We don't have to be uh, servile to science, but we have to be responsive, responsive to it. And the most important thing Christians can do, the two most important things they can do, is one, Christians should know what they're for. Because the press is hostile to Christianity, they always try to get you to say what you're against. You know, well, how do you feel about gay people? And the guy immediately says, well, that's, you know, forbidden. Is that what he should be saying? Maybe he should be talking about what he's for. Maybe he should be talking about the vision of the human person that motivates the things that he says. We need to be better PR people, you know? And the other thing is, live your religion with joy, you know? If your religion is all about wagging your finger in somebody's face and telling them they're wrong, the religion of judge not lest you be judged has become the religion of judgment, you're not a good salesman for your religion. I mean, I, wait, I, I became a Christian when I was almost 50, you know? It has tr transformed my life. It has infused my life with joy. I just try to show that to people. And if they don't want it, they don't have to buy it. But at least it's out there. I believe a, a Christian revival is coming because I believe the ideas of relativism have fallen apart. Yeah. All right. I was wondering if you could sign a book too. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. I should leave it here. I'll come yeah. Back. yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm wondering in what ways do you think that Jewish values, Christian values, and Islamic values are different? Uh, boy, that's, these, these, are, these, are, these are complicated questions. The, the, big, the big difference between Jewish values and Christian values uh, are, is the, the actual relationship with God. Um, there is, if you read the Bible, the uh, Gospels carefully, the law is really set aside. Paul just said the law is over, the law has been fulfilled, it's done. There is nothing as a Christian that you can do to win the favor of God. You are just given the favor of God through grace. It's a very different relationship. Uh, Jesus says in the, uh, in the Gospel, he says, that, you know, you used to be my servant, but now you're my friend. Okay? And, and I think that, that is a different relationship. I, 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 listen, you know, Ben, I tease Ben, but he's a good friend and I love the guy. 
he and I have a different, a different relationship with God. I don't think there's anything I can do to please God. <laughs> you know? I just think he has given me the gift of his pleasure. And I think that's a different relationship. And it's a very intense human relationship between a person and Christ that I don't see in, in, actually in either Judaism or Islam. I think that would be a good example. The thing that, that Trump, when, when I say I've criticized Islam, you know, I don't criticize Islam because of the way they pray to God or because of the ethics here, or ethics there. There's, there are two things that trouble me about Islam that I'm not sure, uh, that I don't think are either in Judaism or in Christianity and that disturb me, okay? One is the difficulty of separating um, government from theocracy. It seems very difficult in my, in my inexpert readings of the Quran, it seems very difficult to separate the government from the theocratic rule. And the second is the fact that the, that the Quran can't be translated. Okay? That causes more problems than you would think because it means that the words can't be interpreted uh, in, in, into different languages, different cultures. One of the things that Christianity did was it would come over and say, oh, you're celebrating that? We'll call that Christmas. You know, Christianity just turns everything into itself, you know? And, and, and I know a lot of Christians get really, really, they'll say, well, Easter is a pagan holiday. I say, great, bring it on board, it's a good one. You know? and, and Christianity is like the blob, you know, it just, eats it, it just keeps going, you know? And I, I, I worry that, that, uh, that because Islam, the Quran can't be translated, that may not be a function of that. But again, the human heart can translate religions into the truth. Uh, so very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, sort of related to one of the questions that was asked earlier. Um, I agree. I think that, like, I mean, the fact that we're becoming secular as a society, or we've been on this track to becoming secular, has been a problem in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is I also think, though, that the fact that Christianity was so entrenched as, like, a Western thing for so long, as you sort of talked about at the beginning of your speech, has kind of caused a very um, like complicated relationship with Christianity, and I think has, in a way, for Christians, made it much more difficult to live life as a Christian, because, because of, um, you know, not just preconceived notions, but just people feel like they have something particular against you as a Christian, because of the reasons you brought up at the beginning of your speech. Um, so my question for you is, do you think that, in a way, um, that increasing secularization, if it's brought kind of to completion ever, would be good for Christianity and allow kind of a revival, like as Christianity is kind of thriving, thriving in places where it's more, you know, thriving in China, right. thriving in places where it's yeah. persecuted? And do you think that there are ways that can be beneficial? Yeah, I, I mean, if the, the problem is that, the, that we're not living in a secular world, we're living in an anti Christian world. Hmm. That is a big deal. Okay? Christianity is the most persecuted religion on earth. It is, uh, and and it, and that is the problem we have. That the I, that Christians have somehow gotten it into their head that we shouldn't be defending our religion, or if we do defend it, we defend it in this kind of chauvinistic way, like you know, get off my you know, get off my Christmas. I mean, throw Christians. <laughs> and and that is a problem. A secular world, a world in which Christianity can only be chosen. It can't be forced. I mean, that is part of its creed. That's part of the way it started. One of the things that I think went awry for Christianity is it got so much power that it began to lose touch with those things. When I compared Christianity to a mother and father, think about having a father who was very uh, tough on you and didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, didn't give you a lot of leeway, and then suddenly in his later life, as you were getting to be about 15, suddenly thought, you know, I'm kind of being a jerk. It had a total change of heart. And, and be developed in his life and became a nicer person. You would say, wow, my dad really changed and that's really great, but he really did leave a mark on me from where he was before. And so that's kind of the situation that we're in because it took Christianity. Look, if, if we had just done the things that Jesus said when he said them, we'd have been better off. It took 2,000 years to really start to get the idea. They're complicated thoughts. So, so sec secular, uh, a secular free world is a necessity for Christianity, but not an anti-Christian world. So that's the difference in my mind. Okay. Does that answer you? Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a historical question. So in the beginning, we were talking about how Socrates and Jesus both kind of lived or came about in a time where objective truth was being attacked, so to say, so to speak. And so my question is, was Socrates successful for restoring the concept of objective truth? And if he was, how was it destroyed such that 300 years later, Jesus was present to restore it? Well, first of all, it's two different cultures. And, and second of all, 
<laughs> you remind me of a conversation I had with my son. My son, this very day, earned his doctorate from Oxford in classics, and he is a brilliant, brilliant classical scholar. And I was reading one of Plato's Socratic dialogues, and I said to him, boy, you know, I'm really feeling nostalgic for the wonderful world of Athens where Socrates could walk among the Agora with his friends and discuss philosophy. <laughs> There's this long, embarrassed pause, and then my son said, Dad, they killed Socrates. <laughs> so, so, so the idea that because Socrates did believe that there was objective truth, that transformed the culture that he was in to believe that there was objective truth is not the same as saying that his ideas, more than any other, were injected into the society as a whole. You know, one of the things that happened when the uh, Reformation split, the, broke the monopoly of the Catholic Church is a lot of these problems came back. If you read Hamlet, I think that's what Hamlet is about. Hamlet is about Shakespeare thinking. When Hamlet went to college where Luther banged up the 95 Thesis, I think Shakespeare was saying, how can you decide what the truth is if the church is wrong, right? So a lot of those relativistic problems came back. They're always there. They never go away. It's just which ideas are dominant at any given time. First off, thank you so much for coming. I'm very thankful for the absence of any litter super soakers. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was jealous that I got so much attention. <laughs> the night's young. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, had, I had a bit of a lighthearted and maybe off topic question, which is why I was trying to position myself close to the back of the line, but that doesn't seem to have worked. Um, I was hoping to draw on your experience as a screenwriter and a novelist and a creative writer in general. And so, I was wondering, if you had to write a book detailing the future of Western civilization, let's say, in California specifically, 50 years from now, if it were completely removed from all of these traditions that you are have been talking about all of tonight, what would be the most tragically comic element of that? <laughs> tragically comic. Ah, uh, wow. Um, you know, I think that the, the, tra the tragic comedy that I fear we're heading for is utter happiness and utter savagery at the same time. You know? Steve, Stephen Pinker has this book, I'm sure you've heard of, called Enlightenment Now, where he says everything is great, everything is going terrific, you know? But if you pay attention to like, what he's saying between the lines, some of the things that are going terrific are like, you know, abortion is great. He loves abortion. So, so you can have a world in which you can have a world in which everybody's really happy and everybody's healthy and their bodies hanging <laughs> in the room and they're saying, oh, I need an arm. Sorry, you know, I know it's your arm, but I'm taking your arm because I'm rich and you're poor, so I get there. That's the kind of like world I fear we might uh, uh, careen into if we lose our faith entirely. Um, I'm not sure what's so comic about that, except I have a sick mind. So it's a little, a little comic, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's what I fear. They laugh too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I want to thank you for coming, of course, um, and I just wanted to touch on, uh, I have to agree with you that uh, I think we should be able to discuss a lot more things, uh, especially theology and uh, religious ideas, and I, I do think that there has been a transformation over time in terms of uh, Christianity, like, allowing for different peoples, and obviously uh, I understand that you think that this uh, idea has to be fleshed out over time, and this would uh, actually be, like, an absolute more uh, that existed within the religion would have to be to be developed over time. Um, but uh, just a theological idea, um, in terms of, uh, I'd say the only religion, uh, which you uh, touched on Christianity being this religion that allows for all these other um, cultures to exist, but simultaneously you believe that Christianity is right. Um, I do think that there is the theological distinction that I would make in terms of a Christian believing that like no one else is going to heaven. You made the joke about like dragging Ben Shapiro on a leash uh, to get him to heaven um, and how that um, actually isn't like this inclusive and you, then you said that all other religions are like this. Um, Judaism would be uh, different. I'm not sure if oh, you're aware. But that's not, that's, I, I, that is a joke. Christianity does not believe that only Christians get into heaven. Yes, but there is the acceptance. You don't think that there is a need to accept Jesus as... No, C.S. Lewis said we know that you can only get into heaven through Christ, but we don't know how Christ does it. And uh, and basically, that I, I believe I believe that you can believe in Christ without knowing his name. Uh, when, when they talk about name in the Bible, it usually means nature. You know, it doesn't mean your name is Bill, it means your... You know, yes, uh, and, I agree. 
And so I, 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 I believe that. I think many Christians believe C.S. Lewis did. He said, you, you do not know how Christ will get us into heaven, but we know yet it has to be through. But the mainstream does involve some sort of, meaning you will go to church because you want to practice. Oh, I, I don't want to see that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, you will go to church or act in a certain way because you believe that that is like part of your process. Is it not? I, I, I go to church for, for myself, for me, right? <coughs> because it's good for me to do that. And, and I think it's, it's right and good for me to As I understand it, the way that you get into heaven, or the way that you find eternal life, is by belief in, in Christ. And as I say, you might not know his name, right? Now, belief looks like something. I believe in gravity, so I don't walk off yes. the roof, right? <laughs> so I believe in Christ, so I, I try to behave and search for certain things in myself. Now, because it tells me that I'm not supposed to judge anybody else, what anybody else is doing, just me, I'm just supposed to be looking at what I'm doing. I don't have to tell other people what that looks like to them. I only think about what it looks like to me. That to me is in the Gospels, written out. Sorry, I was more speaking to a way that it's practiced in the mainstream. And uh, if I'm going on too long, just let me know. But uh, in terms of how Christianity is practiced, it isn't this idea that like one can <coughs> believe in Christ by a different name and practice their own religion, because clearly that is not what I would say most Christians believe. You can correct me if you think I'm wrong. Um, and that idea um, of inclusivity of all cultures had to be, uh, if that idea truly existed, why uh, did it not exist? Why does it not exist theologically? And I can believe that you, as an individual, believe that, but I don't think that that is the way, mainstream way of practicing it. Yeah, you may be, you may be right. They're yeah. wrong, and I'm right. <laughs> okay. okay, so you would say that you speak for yourself as an individual, but not. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and again, I am I am quoting C.S. Lewis, who was one of the great uh, apologists. I, I, absolutely, I've yeah. read C.S. Lewis. Just again, not the way. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I uh, think you're talking. So my question is about your opinions on literature and art more generally, and uh, specifically in the context of uh, literature classes, let's say, in college campuses. Literature classes? Yeah, classes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the teaching of literature. So is, um, is, is art always upstream from politics, or uh, is there a space where uh, literature need not be Literature and art need not be uh, necessarily politicized. Well, I, yeah, I think that that phrase, you know, as Shelley said, uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Um, I, I don't think that phrase, I think that phrase is taken too literally. Basically, you know, if, oh, if we only make movies that have conservative messages in them, this is why conservatives make, you know, can't get in, break into the movie business. If we only make movies with conservative messages in them, they, that will flow down and the guys will vote Republican in the, the Ohio 145th district. You know, that's, that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is that good stories can be put to bad ends, right? And, and we want stories that are <coughs> basically filled with truth. I, I'm, I'm happy for any story that tells the truth, right? Any story that tells the truth is my story because I believe God is God of the real world so that you can find him where, where the truth is. Um, so what, 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 oh, so the, but what bothers me about the teaching of, of literature now is that it's been utterly politicized. So to me, when you teach literature, the purpose of teaching literature should be to find out what the person who wrote the book was trying to communicate to you, right? Not necessarily philosophically, just in terms of what was the story. What story is Jane Austen trying to tell? What did Jane Austen know about the regions in England that you don't know? That's what teaching a book should be about. Not about your stupid ideas about feminism that are now overlaid on Jane Austen so she can't talk. You know, it's like they gag Jane Austen by putting over ideas of colonialism and ideas of um, uh, feminism. All that. Not that that stuff's not interesting, just first find out what the author was trying to communicate. That's what teaching literature should be about. It shouldn't be political at all. Thank you for coming, and especially for opening up this question. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, so I think you made a pretty compelling case that uh, a lot of the values we hold dear in the West come from Christianity and Christian roots. Um, my question is about the necessity of connecting those values to the religions they came from, right? Because it seems to me that saying that because we have Christian values, we must therefore, um, you know, we should support Christianity today. It's somewhat of a like fallacy, right? I mean, certainly people don't need to go to church every Sunday to, to hold these values, as you have said yourself, right? We all kind of have it in our DNA, in a way. 
Um, and you know, with that, on top of the fact that around the world, atrocities are and have been committed in the name of religion, even if those religions, even if they were necessarily you know, believing them correctly, right. they wouldn't do those things. The fact is that religion still does lead to a lot of undesirable outcomes. So do you think there is a path forward where we can believe the good things from religion and take those forward with us without the religion itself? And if so, or if not, do you think we should? Okay, great question, uh, first of all. Um, I, people ask me a lot, can a, an atheist be a good person? And my answer is yes, of course an atheist can be a good person, but he can't be a good person to make sense. <laughs> and, 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 I think, and I think the things that don't make sense ultimately collapse. One of the things that has happened to your educational system, okay, is there used to be a thing called the Great Conversation. And the Great Conversation was all the great thinkers of the West, Aristotle, Plato, all, the, all of them, quite, talking to each other and trying to reach toward truth. And this was conceived of by intellectuals as a secular idea, right? Because once you put God into it, you were leaving out certain people from the conversation, like Nietzsche, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a purely secular idea. But it occurred to the postmodernists to say, well, how do you know there is truth? And there was no answer. You needed God to have that moral truth. I, I, one of the reasons I became a Christian is because the only atheist who ever made sense to me was the Marquis de Sade, who said, he, the guy they named sadism after, who said, there's no God, so we might as well kill each other for fun. You know? I thought, yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I get that. You know? So in other words, I think ideas that, I, I think it's just a question of reason, pure reason. Ideas that make sense survive, it's hard questioning. Ideas that don't make sense ultimately collapse. And so that's, that's my answer to you. I think, that, um, I think that ultimately we're going to have to connect with some version of the Christian God if we're going to support the rights that we have. Okay. And your, your reason to prefer Christianity as the objective truth over any other uh, religion would just be because it's been more successful? Or well, because I think it's true, but I think also also because a, a God, a, a personal God of love, who believes that, uh, that who endows his creation with certain rights, and possibly the most important line ever written by anybody is, God made man in his image. I think without that, that essential belief, uh, you're kind of screwed. Thank you. Um, uh, I was wondering, do you ever think there's a connection between cultural relativism and, uh, and say like modern art or like that sort of have a connection? Because I always think of as an artist, I'm, I'm sure you probably go to the streets and study it, but like paintings, for example, always have like this precision to it uh, prior to modern art, right? Like everything has to be precise. You have to look at like refraction, you have to look at like, how subsurface scatter is going off the skin. And, and there's also like, I think everyone looked at Newtonian physics being very, very particular. And then therefore there must be a God, right? And then and then when Einstein said, well, here's the theory of relativity, here's, you know, time isn't consistent. And then people start painting the idea of Salvador Dali tripping clocks. And, and then eventually, like, modern art just kind of, like, degraded. And that's also sort of where we are politically because of that. Like, what's, the, what's the question? The question, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that, on that idea? Well, <laughs> no, I, I think it's a, it's a huge question. You're obviously right. There's obviously connections between all these things. The most important uh, question, I think, that has been lost in, in this is, is the authority of the human experience. Okay? That's what we're talking about, the authority of the human experience. So I, I see the sky, it looks like a big blue dome, but it's not a big blue dome, right? And yet it, if I see a rainbow in the sky, that gives me a feeling of beauty. At what point is beauty truth and truth beauty? Right? But this is the, the question that, that uh, artists have been struggling with really since the 16th century. I mean, they've been struggling with the idea of where, where do we fit in the creation of truth and the creation of truth. And the problem with modern art is it basically has cut human beings off from this truth. There are no faces in it. There's no beings. There's no shapes. There's no forms. There's just this de declaration of a theory, basically, in the form of a painting. And I, I think that I, I don't personally agree with that. I personally, I personally think that the human experience is what life is about. It is what life is about. And so that we have to capture where the human experience is true and where it is not true and how we can bring those two things together. And that to me is what art is all about. And that is the subject of art. So it's a big question. I know that's not a thorough answer, but I mean, it's something I kind of like to write a book about. So it's something I think about a lot. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, I look forward to that book. <laughs>
Also, I got another question. Why does Ben Shapiro refer to Michael Knowles as extraable? First of all, I, I always say, people always ask me this, these questions, and I tell them I pick on Knowles because I love him. Uh, ben picks on him because he wants to kill him. Um, <laughs> and and one, one of the things is, is Knowles wrote this blank book that has sold more copies than Ben has ever sold. <laughs> And my, my attitude was like, good for, good for Knowles. <laughs> and Ben's attitude was, I will hunt him down. <laughs> so, is there a connection between like, the fact that Knowles has like, a troll-like nature and then the fact that Ben dislikes Milo? Or like, they, they have a beef? I know that they both have like, I feel like Milo kind of has a troll-like nature too. Yeah, Milo has a troll-like nature, like nature, but he's actually gone off the, the, the deep end. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I don't know, I know he's gone. No, pretty far. Yeah, you know, there, there are philosophical differences between Knowles and me and Knowles and Ben, but I don't think that's it. And I, I think Ben actually does like the guy. I really do. We, we tease each other and it's become almost a routine. Okay. Uh, but we're really just picking on him. Yeah. So at the start, all came, came <laughs> the book, so. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. And also, he lost, he lost the bet with him about the Trump winning. Oh, okay. Which cost him, which cost him money with, with Shapiro. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and for giving this talk. Um, I have two questions. Yeah. I was wondering, um, so my first question is, to what extent do you believe that perhaps the liberal transformation of mainstream Protestantism has perhaps contributed to the rise of an anti-Christian atmosphere in America? That the liberal transformation of mainstream Protestantism is certainly, uh, is certainly related to the fact that mainstream Protestantism is dying. I mean, it's related to that. But no, I think anti-Christianity is anti-Westernism, basically. basically. I think that there is a sense, you know, in, in my youth, we went through a kind of re recognition that, you know, I grew up saying the Pledge of Allegiance and believing that America was our, and we went through this, you know, recognition that we had done bad things, which I think was a, a healthy thing. We experienced shame. Some of us then went on to say, okay, now we've experienced the shame, we move on, we can't fix the past, we move on to a future where we do better, you know. Some people, I think, the left got immersed in this shame and just continue to flog themselves, and they feel that there's some power and virtue that they've gotten out of that. And I just think that that's wrong, and that's part of it. I think that's the reason they hate Christianity. They don't hate Christianity to create that system. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so just as a follow-up question, now, this isn't uh, by designing scapegoats, but where would you have to assign uh, the origins, perhaps, of this rise of this both here in America and at large. Well, I think that the West had a, a, a feeling that the people, who, the people who had a sense of revulsion against the West became our communicators, our professors, uh, you know, they were, our Hollywood people. They went into all the businesses where you don't have to prove that what you're saying is true. Okay. Like, they didn't become the engineers, they didn't become the rocket scientists, they didn't become the thing where you say, well, I'll just put the screw in here because I feel like it, right? They, they didn't do that. They went into places where you don't have to prove that what you're saying is true, but those are very powerful places, and I think that they have spread uh, their own self-hatred and their own hatred throughout the West. Then my, my second question is, um, if you believe in objective morality, and there's Well, that's, those are several different questions, actually. I mean, first of all, to tolerate um, actions that you believe to be... To, to, to accept that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it is in the Gospels that we judge not lest you be judged. You should be paying attention to the beam, the plank in your own eye, rather than the little dot in the other guy's eye. I think that that is incredibly good advice that no one has ever taken, right? I mean, I think that if you only had that line, if that's the only line you had, you could deduce the crucifixion. You know, <laughs> once you tell people that they can't pass judgments on their neighbors, it's like, kill that guy, you know? So that's, so that's you know, that's very much a part of who we are, you know? The only thing, there's a difference between a sin and a crime. A crime is where I hurt you. Sometimes a sin is just me hurting myself, and you, it's none of your business. So that's, it's that simple, you know? Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you for coming to talk today. The whole question of moral objectivism, moral relativism, is something that I personally study quite a bit. Um, looking for answers, I look for 
you know, Stanford philosophy, those kinds of pages, and realize that the debate between these two things are is very largely unsettled within the actual philosophical discipline. Um, so I'm wondering, you take this principle where you know some ideas will make society thrive, and some ideas will cause it to maybe collapse. Do you think it is possible to form a stable society based off of moral relativism using that principle of choosing ideas that allow a society to thrive in some that no. and disregarding the ones that make it fail? No, because why should you? Why should you do it? I mean, why shouldn't you just do the ideas that, make, if you've got the guns, why not just do the ideas that make you powerful and everybody has to shut up? I don't, you know, why would you do it? Uh, because you have basic things within yourself like empathy, well then, it, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly from, from your empathy, you can start to deduce an object of morality. The fact that you're, you think your empathy is better than your non-empathy suggests that there's an objective morality. The problem is, no one believes that morality is relative. Only the Marquis decided he was a psychopath. Nobody, <laughs> nobody believes, nobody believes that morality is relative. You know, here's, here's the thing. I, I, I had this conversation with myself for 40 years. I did. I wrote novel after novel about the search for moral reality. And it one day occurred to me that every system is built, as I said, on an axiom, something that you can't prove. And my axiom is that it's better to give a beggar bread than to torture a child to death. That's my axiom. That's what I believe is a self-evident, unprovable truth. Okay. I believe that if I landed on a planet where everybody thought that was wrong and I was the only person who thought it was right, I would be right. Once you believe that, you get to Jesus. It only takes about 15 more years. <laughs> you will get to Jesus. But, but look, what you're struggling with, what you're struggling with is that leap of faith where you say, oh, even moral relativism is based on an axiom. So if I'm going to have an axiom, I might as well have, my thing is, I might as well have an axiom I actually believe. I don't actually believe that if everybody on earth became a Nazi, Nazism would suddenly be right. I don't believe that. And neither do you. So why believe something you don't believe? I believe that it's better to give a beggar bread than to torture a child to death. And I think you believe that too. And I think everybody believes it who's not a psychopath. So let's start with that accent. You know, that, that seems to be the, the best argument. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. I'm kind of old. <laughs> Me too. Welcome, welcome to the <laughs> My brain is calcified, and my question is not philosophical, it's rather basic. Um, Daily Wire is, is a great service, uh, and you have four people that often read the news every day. You have this wonderful background in writing books and writing screenplays, and I know you desperately want there to be more books and screenplays yeah. and acts of art. So if I can ask for you to consider an idea, see it's still a question. Uh, can you consider maybe one day a week having like a master class that takes over the course of a half a year about you know, your methodology for writing a book or your methodology for writing a screenplay. And that way people, I, I've done this before with photography with a, a website called Strobist, how to use, you know, proper lighting and photography. And it's amazing the people that develop into, into great photographers through that, through that system. Uh, so I'm asking if you could consider doing that, which is you have a lot of people that can read the news, you do a good job of it, but what, the, what, what uh, Knowles can't do is he cannot uh, give a good master class in writing for a photograph of the screenplay. Because yeah, he's ex-people. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not a bad idea. I, when we started The Daily Wire, I was, it was just me and Ben basically doing uh, like 15, 20 minute podcast. <clears throat> and um, I was going to do culture and he was going to do the news. And uh, we could not get right wingers to care about the culture. And so I started doing the news as well from a different perspective. You know? um, and um, the human perspective. Uh, <laughs> I hope, I hope uh, <laughs> um, no, I, th I think it's an interesting idea, and I, I'll think about it. There are certain things that I do want to talk about um, re regarding the culture that may be a little too specific uh, for the audience. I don't know. And just a really quick invite, because you say that you know the things we have to be is we have to be joyous in yeah. what we do, and I'm very happy that you sometimes bring up the subject of abortion which can be a very difficult and also very dark subject. So I invite you, every January, towards the end of January, we have an annual Walk for Life West Coast in San Francisco. The weather is much better than the, the, the Washington Walk for Life. 
and, and it's joyous. Uh, you, you would be surprised that you know you go in there and like, you get like close to fifty thousand people take part in it. So I invite you and the rest of the Daily Wire staff to come up and to take part in it. Not as not as official people, but just you know walk along with the rest of us. I appreciate. It. We're running very low on time, so this is going to be the last question. Okay. Exalted Lord Clayton. <laughs> uh, a recent poll of Americans about their religious preference for the first time showed a plurality declaring atheism. Declaring no religious affiliation. Well, okay. I thought it was atheism, per se. I thought it was actually that word. But it's a trend, in any case. And I'm wondering if you think that subsection of the culture that answered that question that way is, going back to your metaphor, are they denying their parentage or are they orphans? Are they, are they, you know, are they becoming unmoored from the Christian tradition of Western civilization? Well, yes, and I think that they've been caught in an intellectual uh, tie that they haven't really thought through. I'm very hopeful about this, by the way. I, I believe, oh, you might be. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> but I, I can't help myself. Um, I'm very hopeful about it because I do believe that secular ideas have fallen apart. And when that happens, this is, you're going to get this situation, right, where, people, where they're still kind of carrying people along on the tide, but certain people start to step out of the tide and say, wait a minute, this tide is going the wrong direction. Okay? And I see that happening already. The smartest people I know, the smartest people I know, are becoming Christians. The smartest kids I know, the people who are college age, are gathering together and talking about the Gospels. The smartest people, the people who are like way, way the IQ wise behind, the, uh, above anybody in, that I know in my generation, right? Because young people get smarter and smarter. Um, and the reason for that is, is twofold, I think. One is the idea of moral relativism has fallen apart. The idea that you say, well, you know, nothing is true. And the minute somebody says, well, is that true? It's not, you, know, it's not, you start to think, oh, this is internally absurd, okay? So that has started to fall apart. It takes a while, as I say, for these things to develop. But the other thing is this. The narrative that took us to atheism was a legitimate narrative. They looked at Newton's science. You know, the romantics used to toast confusion to science and to Newton, right? They used to hate Newton because he had disenchanted the world, right? The science of Newton looked like it was going to develop a clockwork world where every cause was known. But in fact, that, we fell through that floor. It didn't happen that way. We now have a world in which um, scientists admit that the world as it is, as it is, as it is created, could not have come about by accident. So they've invented a theory of multiverses. You know, they call it the Lord of the Multi. They, they, they invented a theory of multiverses. This just happens to be the universe that looks like it was spoken into existence by a gigantic invisible Jew, right? <laughs> it just happens to be the world that looks like somebody said, let there be light. That's a stupid theory, and it's unprovable, right? So it's just an idea. It's like me saying, oh yeah, I did pull four straight flushes in a row. This just happens to be that poker game, you know? So I think that science is not going the way that Newton and Newton's people would have thought it was. And I think that as that happens, we're going to start to think like, you know what? Even science may need a creator god. So, to pull, think. polls notwithstanding, you, you see this trend I, I see it. An reversing. Yes, I think that there's going to be a revival that comes from the intellectual top. I was just reading the book by that um, uh, uh, Hawking, uh, the last book before he died, he wrote this book, Answering the Big Questions. And, you know, brilliant, brilliant man, and a wonderful personality, and a wonderful... And when he started talking about why he didn't believe in God, I was sitting there going, you know, I can take these arguments apart. These are not good arguments. And, and I think that when a guy that brilliant is reciting arguments that a guy like me can take apart, something has gone awry with the, the, the intellectual theory. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you very much.